Alicia. I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. I just wanted to make sure that everybody is able to hear me loud and clear. We can hear you. Perfect. All right, uh, moving on to the first slide, please. I will be addressing CLIA and CAP and to uh, go through the benefits of understanding this regulatory in order to advance a laboratory career. I will say that I have no conflicts of interest and my only disclaimer is that the opinions and comments in this slide are not a reflection of my employer, uh, Thermo Fisher Scientific. Next slide, please. Today's learning objectives are gonna focus on comparing and contrasting two regulatory bodies, CLIA and CAP, which many laboratorians are familiar with. We're gonna list benefits of knowing regulatory requirements and describe how knowledge of these requirements can advance your career as a medical laboratory scientist. Next slide, please. Starting out with CLIA, if you're working in the laboratory, you've probably heard this thrown around many times. This started way back in 1967, and it was revised big time in 1988, finally uh, being uh, voted on in 1992. This occurred because in 1987, a series of newspaper articles were bringing up uh, health issues, and they were starting to question the laboratory quality and the integrity. Um, and this started with the cytotechnology area of the entry part of the laboratory. So, of course, when you open up a can of worms, you're going to be scrutinizing every portion of the laboratory. So, congressional hearings were heard, and were, the laboratories were investigated. If you type in CLIA into your search bar of any internet, you may not actually end up with the clinical laboratory improvements amendments. Uh, typically, if you type in CLIA, you're going to end up with the Cruise Lines, Inter excuse me, Cruise Lines International Association. This is obviously not where you want to be. And one of the difficult parts is really honing into where to find information with regards to CLIA. Next slide, please. The CLIA uh, Improvement Act was made to improve certification and oversight of the testing of the entire country. This was focused primarily for human being testing, and all of a sudden the standards focus on accuracy, reliability, and timeliness for clinical laboratory testing. Next slide, please. The issue document in 1992 highlighted these purposes of ensuring quality, preserving access to testing, especially for those in rural areas where it may become more of a problem, using of new technology. So keeping up with the advances in technology and then applying them to the clinical laboratory, uh, applying minimal standards based on test complexity. And we're gonna discuss the different test complexities coming up in a few slides. And establishing a cost-effective requirement that are achievable for settings that perform testing. So this is looking at the cost regarded to patient and also the healthcare system. And that link at the bottom is where you can find an online edited version um, with regards to the CLIA uh, responsibilities for laboratories. Next slide, please. Why CLIA is the list of rules, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services are the enforcers of the rules. This is the arm of our government system that is responsible for overseeing to make sure that quality is encompassed and monitored in the laboratory system. So again, CLIA is the list of rules, but CMS is the enforcer of these rules. Next slide, please. Now, if you can imagine having CMS oversee every laboratory, physician's laboratory office in the entire United States is would be very cumbersome and overwhelming. So what CLIA did, or CMS did, was they granted accreditation to various regulatory agencies to help them. So if you apply for your CLIA license, the first thing that you're going to get is a certificate of registration. And this is important to know when you're walking into a laboratory to be looking for these certificates that should be uh, visually publicly displayed upon entering the building. This registration indicates that they have filed for recognition for CLIA and they are requesting an inspection to come along. If the laboratory 
processes all the paperwork correctly and they are ever able to have their inspection, they then will receive a certificate of compliance from CMS. And again, this should also be publicly visible in the laboratory. On the other hand, laboratories have the option of going the certificate of accreditation route. And this is to go through organizations that CMS has deemed appropriate to conduct inspections on their behalf. Next slide, please. One of these organizations that achieved this accreditation is the College of American Pathologists, also known very widely in the laboratory field as CAP. They were acknowledged as having deemed status in 1994 by CMS, and they are recognized as having the most stringent and toughest standards with regards to laboratory quality. One thing to note is that the CAP is a pathologist directed organization. And if you know anything about the hierarchy of laboratories, laboratories are overseen by pathologists with regards to medical testing. Next slide, please. Another mention here is going to be for COLA. This is the Commission on Office Laboratory Accreditation. This is another regulatory uh, uh, agency that deemed was deemed accreditation status in 1993 by CMS, but this is also a physician-directed organization. So in reviewing the two, CLIA versus CAP, having a different organization overseeing it sometimes leads to different standards or quality control uh, methods. Uh, while many laboratories are COLA, uh, the majority, especially those laboratories that are focused in molecular testing, they lean towards CAP. Next slide, please. So why would people lean towards CAP? What does CAP have that CLIA doesn't? Well, for starters, there are dis discipline-specific test lists that are updated annually. This gives the laboratory more black and white standards to compare their quality to. Peer inspections are included as part of the CAP program. So internal inspections are done before the external CAP certifications are done. Additionally, CLIA, or excuse me, CAP also contains a proficiency testing program. We will discuss what this is and what the importance is and why that combination with CAP's offerings is a benefit to laboratories. Next slide, please. So for those labs that focus on molecular testing, one of the reasons they choose to go with CAP is because CLIA is fairly outdated. Uh, we recently had some changes, but not with regards to the standards involving with medical, excuse me, molecular testing and advances in technology. Currently, CLIA only has two mentions of molecular, while CAP offers an entire molecular pathology checklist for their laboratories. And it really digs into various types of instrumentation and applications. For example, on the right, coming from CAP, we have specific mention of next generation sequencing and also for arrays and different procedures that are not even remotely encompassed in the CLIA guidelines. And that is just due to the fact that CAP is certainly on top of uh, the technology that's offered today, which if you remember is one of the requirements for CLIA is to make sure that technology is observed and used where most appropriate as times change. Next slide, please. Also within the CAP checklist are these nice boxes that point out instructions to inspectors, but also what types of questions that would be asked. So labs have a better idea of what the inspectors are going to be looking for when they come in the, in the door. Leah's outline of standards is very black and white, which gives you a lot of options for flexibility. However, for those inspectors that are really going to hone in on specific questions regarding molecular technology, or for in this case, specimen collection and handling, uh, the checklists are really nice to open up what type of appropriate measures need to be taken to be prepared and pass their su inspection successfully. Next slide, please. Here's another example of excerpts. On the left, we have the CLIA standard, and on the right, we have the 
cap checklist. And you, again, you can see not only is the cap checklist itemized with an explanation of what they are looking for, there are important notes that have been added in there. In addition, they even give a check of evidence of compliance, something specific that's documented in the laboratory that the inspector will be looking to make sure that this standard is met. Additionally, you'll see in the lower right, there's also references. So this is scientific based papers or guidances from clinical laboratory standards institutes or other organizations to help provide evidence as to how to tackle this uh, checklist requirement. Next slide, please. This is a diagram of the CAP inspection uh, application process. So CAP is a membership program. So laboratories that would like to be part of the CAP program, they must go through this process in order to become CAP members, starting with, of course, an application, which needs to be repeated. And then you have inspections that are on there. And then if you have just, uh, in, excuse me, if you have deficiencies within that inspection, you need to review them, correct them, and then send in your corrections or prove that you've corrected them to CAP. And once this first year is in, in the system, um, each year is going to be a different part of the review system. And you, there are requirements that you will have to do for CAP, whether it be peer inspection or having a peer inspection or different parts of the regulatory quality management system. So CAP does a really great job at keeping labs on top of things because they always have this constant um, process. Next slide, please. Why is it important to be familiar with these regulatory requirements? Regulatory is a huge part of the clinical laboratory. As anyone who's ever had medical treatment, whether it be for your family member or for yourself, you want to ensure that your loved one or yourself is getting the best treatment possible. And that means getting the right test ordered the first time and getting accurate results based on specimen connection. So this is really important to not only the library, but also as an informed consumer when you are looking to have your own laboratory test done. But there are different types of test complexities that we must be aware of. There's waived, moderate complexity, and high complexity. And each of these test designations have with it specific testing personnel requirements, but also proficiency testing requirements that we are going to discuss further. Why is it important to know all of these? Because as the laboratory population starts to turn over, and we've definitely seen a lot of people leave the laboratory field uh, since the pandemic hit us, it's more and more important that we backfill individuals that are familiar with these regulations, because these regulations apply to every lab in the United States. And understanding how to maneuver through them helps not only laboratories for a hiring standpoint, but also for managers and supervisors that may be looking to fill advanced roles within their own company. Next slide, please. More reasons. So in addition to not only knowing those test designations of moderate high complexity and moderate complexity, you also need to know the difference between validation and verification. You must be familiar with your in instrument maintenance and also quality control measures. These are spelled out not only in the CLIA documents, but also in the CAP documents. And the reason that this is important is because verification and validation still cost money. This is long before a lab gets up and running live with patient testing in order to start uh, making money on the tests that they are offering. You don't want to do any more red tape testing than you have to because you ultimately may be spending more money than had been budgeted to get a test up and running. We are to discuss verification and validation and why they're important. If you're ever doing a training with a vendor or an instrument manufacturer, you want to make sure you get those maintenance records because you have to show to CAP and CLIA that you are a, you are staying within the guidelines that the manufacturer provided so that your instrument is well cared for and providing accurate results. Next slide, please. So looking at a big comparison, this question gets asked a lot. So while I used to be in the 
laboratory, I am now working with an analytical validation specialist team. So my responsibility is to help labs get up to speed with testing by helping them conduct their analytical validation or guidance for their verification. Labs need to understand what they have to test or what they need to do for their validations. And while many labs are very proficient in this, we've definitely seen a decline in laboratories with fully staffed individuals that are know a broad range of this. The supervisors, the managers, um, HR, they're going to be more familiar with these types of things, but not necessarily every um, laboratory science at the bench level. So this is where people can brush up on this regulatory knowledge and really expand their uh, career um, ideas or moving forward uh, by getting to know how to do this. Validations require different components than your verification. In a sense, verification is just saying, I would like to show that the instrument in the chemistry is performing as the manufacturer claimed. So you are verifying the, the manufacturer's claim as to the test that you're doing. Of course, you can go and do over and above verification, uh, but this is the minimum required that is uh, stated by CLIA. Validation is going to add some more components in there. And of course, this is very important for the high complexity testing because there are a lot more checkbox to make sure that are incorporated before you're able to go live with the test. Next slide, please. Personnel qualifications. I would say that this is something that I had no idea about when I was working uh, as a bench tech because the different levels of complexity of testing provide different qualifications for these positions that are spelled out specifically in CLIA. So if you are looking to advance yourself to obtain a general supervisor, supervisor position that is in a high complexity la laboratory, you can go to these standards and find out exactly what you need. Do you have the education? Do you have the experience? Do you have the management? Um, all of those items are addressed in the CLIA standards and they may be very vague, but yet also may also provide the opportunity for flexibility um, in terms of understanding and providing the information that they want. Next slide, please. This is a uh, chart of major CLIA regulatory milestones um, since the development of CLIA in 1988. I will say that it is missing some of the more recent ones um, with regards to how laboratory testing is going to be regulated, regulated in the LDT section. Um, and so this will be being updated probably soon. But just to point out, when, when identifying the fact that CAP has more molecular requirements or regulations, the CLIA milestones only have four updates since its origination in 1988. And if you can imagine, technology has really come a long way with regards to radiography and ultrasound technology and diagnostics in general, uh, molecular testing, multiplexing, singleplexing, um, you know, just looking at where we were, you know, a few years ago during the pandemic and putting in emergency use authorization testing in there also. Those types of things were not necessarily encompassed in the original documentation for CLIA. However, keep in mind that one of the CLIA standards is to provide continuing monitoring of laboratory performance and quality. So it should be expected that CLIA should be updating in order to keep with the time and the different quality systems now available. Next slide, please. Two of the standards that are very important to CLIA and CAP and COLA are proficiency testing and competency testing. And again, playing back into the fact that we have different levels of testing being moderate, waived, and high complexity, testing personnel also have different requirements in order to do that testing. But overall, the competency testing is responsible for the laboratory to make sure that every laboratory performing the test is competent and able to deliver accurate quality results in the end. Competency testing evaluates the laboratory professional. Proficiency testing program evaluates the laboratory system. So you get you receive a sample that you are treating as a patient sample 
through the pre-analytic, analytic, and post-analytic stages of the laboratory system. Consistent testing is very important because it is making sure that test samples are being handled appropriately from start to finish and quality results are being generated by the technology in the laboratory. It is required that each lab must enroll in a proficiency testing program. As I mentioned previously, CAP has a proficiency testing program. However, you do not need to be a member of the CAP in order to participate in the proficiency testing program. I can't tell you how many times in the last three years I've walked into a laboratory and you ask them, are you CLIA or CAP certified? And they'll say, yeah, we're CLIA CAP. Well, what they really meant was they are CLIA certified, but they participate in the CAP proficiency test program. Again, you don't have to be in both of them. You can be in one or the other. But it's important to recognize when a lab is participating in just the proficiency testing program and not the CAP membership itself. This is something that if you recognize in your laboratory and you want, you think it's an opportunity to move towards CAP accreditation, you can start with participation in the proficiency testing program as your first steps to be exposed to CAP and then consider membership afterwards. But knowing the difference between these two types of testing and how to use that to move forward for, uh, let's say, an internal promotion or even an external promotion, laboratories are in need of understanding how to perform this and the importance of doing so. And I do mean by laboratory that should have a protocol for completing their testing, their standard operating procedure. Um, proficiency testing should follow that SOP as written for the specimens for the laboratory, unless CAP provides specific instructions on how to do a different preparation. Once in a while, this will happen with samples that cannot be processed the same as a traditional patient sample. And that's just because uh, the materials that CAP is using for testing may not be 100% uh, biological in nature. They may be commercially derived or synthetic. Next slide, please. Quality system is a really big deal also. And again, if you're working with somebody that's relatively new in the laboratory or perhaps um, primarily on the bench and not aware of the entire quality system, this is another question series that we receive when we go on site and we're working with laboratories. They will also often ask us questions uh, what controls do we use? Or how many times do we have to perform controls? And the guidance that we can provide back to them is, what does your quality management system say? What have you established in your laboratory? And by adding new testing, how do you stay within those confines? This happens, this comes up a lot when we work with uh, laboratories that are implementing new testing and perhaps they've just hired new individuals to perform this testing and they're not familiar with the employer quality system. By pointing them back to a quality system, it points them back to their manager or their supervisor to make sure that anything that is coming within the training for this new testing is going to stay within this quality management system. And often we will get questions, uh, but we cannot provide direct answers for this because we cannot possibly know every quality system of every laboratory. Yes, the generalities should be within the CLIA and CAP standards. Um, however, it's not within our nature to provide guidance as to how to handle questions like this. But again, this goes back to the CLIA standard that there must be a continuous process, evaluation, monitoring, and improvement for the total testing system. And again, that's the pre-analytic, the analytic, and the post-analytic. Pre-analytic is everything that happens to the specimen prior to the actual testing. Analytic is the testing itself. And post-analytic is getting the results into a laboratory information system or out to the physicians to communicate to their patients. And that's how the testing process is broken down. Next slide, please. So moving into the analytic systems, this really is the heart of the clinical laboratory. This is where you can find all of the meat, if you will, for the policies and procedures that are needed. Uh, we often have to point back 
to this to customers that written policies and procedures are necessary for each test. We cannot use one as a blanket for another one. Um, again, addressing verification versus validation. The lab should be setting up a system for how they are going to conduct verifications and how they are conducting validation so that each new or subsequent verification or validation that they bring in-house follows all of the appropriate procedures that they have already uh, set in place. Instrument maintenance and function checks. This is, again, important um, going back to proving that they are staying within the manufacturer's recommendations in order to assure best performance of and the life of the instrument. Control procedures. This is your positive, this is your negative, this is your negative template control, this is your positive extraction control. I'm sure many of these may sound familiar, but you need to have understanding of what different types of controls are you using? Are you using process controls or system controls? There are a lot of different terms, especially across the US and in various different subregions that use different terms for controls and understanding how those terms are used from lab to lab certainly gives you an advantage if you're looking to move out of you know, one type of industry lab into more of a private doctor's lab or perhaps even a research lab or something that works in conjunction with a medical hospital. Knowing how to use controls and how to best apply them is really important, but also to be cost conscientious. It's not always the easiest thing to throw all the controls on there so that you know you have everything right. There must be a cost component that's ass assessed in there because if you outcost your test so that there is no profit, you're going to basically run that test or that lab into the ground per se because you're not recouping your cost. So you have to be very careful the controls that you pick and how much they cost, either they're commercially available or developed, available in-house. But these are very common questions that are asked for us. Comparison of test results, also known as a method comparison. If you are running the same targets on more than one platform, you have to make sure that you're comparing them against each other. So if you have uh, one test on a machine by vendor A, but you also test the same targets in a different panel on machine B, that same material should be tested to coincide that you are getting the same results for that. And again, it, that's going to be analyte specific. It's not going to be all of the tests. If they're just testing, let's say, influenza A on one platform, and then you have a panel that includes influenza A, you must do a test comparison to see if those are coinciding or if they're discrepant results. Corrective actions. This falls into the quality management system. When something goes wrong in the monitoring process or in the live process, it must be documented. It must have notes. It must have root cause analysis. The point of having these corrective actions are to prevent the same problems from happening again. So that is why the quality, quality management, observation, improvement part is really important because we want to stay on top of up-to-date technology or improvements or even recommendations that come from organizations, uh, lab testing recommendations. Test records are another important component of the analytic process. So this is how long do records need to be retained? Can they be retained on a thumb drive or USB drive? Do they need to be centrally located? Can they cross through the LIS intranet or versus intranet? This is important because different tests have different uh, retention. Many of the genetic tests have at least a 10 year program or 10 year retention requirement, while there are some other basic tests that only have two years. So knowing the complexity of the test helps you understand the test record system. And so when you are implementing or building in a new test, you have the knowledge to figure out the most analytical part of this after the test is resulted and given out. And again, we have our analytic systems quality assessment for ongoing improvement. Next slide, please. So what are these benefits? So in looking at varying job responsibilities, you can serve as an internal inspector. 
you will be going to either your own hospital system or a sister hospital system in the area, and you'll be getting to see what other labs are doing. Author, excuse me, author policies and procedures. This is definitely one way that I started to get my foot into the regulatory system because it was relatively easy. I was already going for the training for the instruments. And so I became the key operator in knowing its ins and outs. And I became the best person to write the policies and the procedure for that testing because I had gone through manufacturer training, but I also knew how our internal laboratory information structure worked. So I could definitely build the procedure within the electronic health record system that we had for managing policy and procedures. Managing co staff competency. It's not easy for one person to monitor, let's say a, a lab of 24 or 25, maybe even more. Labs often have different departments and there are people within that department that have to manage staff, staff competency. Competency is an ongoing thing. You have initial hire training paperwork. You also have six month paperwork on testing, the competency testing that needs to be done. And then you have a year testing. And again, the different complexity of testing determines how much staff competency is required and the frequency by which is required. So this is another way to slowly move into regulatory knowledge to be uh, Permit, excuse me, promotion eligible within your facility. If managing the staff competency is enough, there's always proficiency testing. Again, as every lab is required to do that, somebody must be in charge of getting the results reported into the appropriate uh, method, whether it's electronic or paper. And somebody must make sure that they're organized to make sure that no proficiency testing is missed or that the results come back in a timely fashion and that they're documented. In addition, if there was a problem with the proficiency testing, an investigation needs to be done. Somebody needs to oversee what went wrong with that particular test and how to prevent uh, a wrong interpretation moving forward. Again, verification and validations, those are perfect ways to start advancing your career because again, you kind of have to get familiar with all of the other things that we've talked about in order to make things work. And that's definitely an opportunity to show responsibility and also record keeping, but also taking on a lot of responsibility that can really help you shine in terms of what you're capable of. With regards to external inspection opportunities, so if you thought you learned a lot by going to the sister lab that's part of your health system, going to other labs outside of your health system are also very interesting you get to see how they are either doing it well or they are doing it poorly. And you can come back to your laboratory and discuss with your supervisor, hey, I saw this, this is working really great. We've been looking for another way to improve this. So getting to see other laboratories is only a benefit, only a benefit to you because you are get to see how other things are working and how you can, again, provide recommendations or to make things better. Again, this is an important part of identify, re replicate, and implement um, different labs' achievements, and certainly learning from their failures at the same time without having to go through it yourself. Reimbursement has definitely become a hot topic over the last 10 years. Um, the Palmetto Mold DX program definitely is affecting clinical customers. There were new changes that were implemented in April of 2022 that are still having cascading events or cascading um, problems that have been occurring with this as labs have to adjust their panels and their offering within this constriction to make sure that they are going to meet reimbursement. So if you're interested in the dollars and you are technically savvy because you participated in verification or validation, people are needed to address the Moldex technical assessments. And this is only going to become more prevalent as time goes on. Um, while this program does not oversee all 50 states, it does oversee many of them. And if you happen to be in one of those states, it's good to understand what these requirements are and how they uh, affect your laboratory. Next slide, please. Again, looking at career advancement. This is not limited to internal, but also external. Again, participating in inspection and learning about 
verification processes and in regulatory, they'll certainly open doors to ex external opportunities. And we're going to talk about a few of those options coming up. Educational opportunities. This is another way that I started into benefiting myself and really uh, broadening my knowledge. Um, I took responsibility for teaching the new laboratory staff came in, which meant that in order to teach them, I had to teach myself, which is where I learned the requirements for testing personnel and the different complexities of testing. Um, and not only that, but you can go beyond just your laboratory staff internally, but you can become a uh, adjunct instructor for MLT or MLS programs, which I've also done. I've been able to take all my experiences and be formal teachers, uh, but we also touch on such things as regulatory, but understanding all edu educational uh, in general is definitely a way to boost your your career. And last but not least, of course, there's the conferences, which is where we are today, as I'm presenting here to you on behalf of the CDC's one of summit. The quality management system. I think this quote gets used often. If you see something, say something. But it's very appropriate in this case because nobody cares about the laboratory more than the laboratory people in it. If you meet with any laboratory individual that has really dedicated their life to this. They have gone through the educational, they have benefited and participated in professional societies. We care the most. We know how to navigate through the requirements. We want the best for our patient, but also for our profession. As someone who represents our profession, I want to be proud of what we do and how we do it. So knowing your lab's quality management system ensures continuous improvement of the performances and services. But again, while each lab has its own quality management system, there should be similarities between all of them. And some labs may do better than others. And you'll see that if you're able to participate in inspections. Next slide, please. So here is the summary of how all of these different things can advance the career. So for example, we talked about different promotion opportunities and this can be internal or it could be external. It could be even a different group within the same company. Regulatory agencies. Let's not forget that all of those inspections still need people to complete the inspections. We have CLIA, we have CAP, we have ASCP, ASCP American Society for Clinical Pathology. We have COLA, we have the Joint Commission. All of these agencies have to understand what's required of the laboratory. So if you really want to market yourself, perhaps to be one of those inspectors or to be responsible for approving paperwork for laboratories, regular agents, regulatory agencies could be in your future. There are many consulting companies that are out there. These are either large, individual, large companies with um, many individuals or even consulting companies consisting of one to two, maybe even three people. These people offer their services because they either stepped out of the laboratory or they are just looking for perhaps seasonal work, if you will, where they're just willing to help um, you know, from time to time. They are not looking for full-time employment, but they can help you get your standards in order so that you can pass your inspection. Or more specifically, um, people that are offering their services to help with validations. So if you were in a relatively young laboratory where not a lot of people have had experience with designing validations, you can reach out to consultants to help with this process. Health code biotech companies are also another one. Those vendors of the manufacturers of the machines that we have in the chemistry, they all need laboratory individuals. Many people get hired with um, physical science or biological science degrees. But I will tell you from experience, having the no of regulatory for the clinical application has really been beneficial, not only to my team, but also the company to make sure that the products that we are creating are of clinical quality and going to meet uh, the required standards uh, by CLIA. So we want companies, we want laboratories to buy the equipment that is going to fall within the regulatory needs that we have. Next slide, please. And how does this all fit together? Well, knowing the laboratory system is gonna improve me, but it's also going to improve our laboratory. 
but it's also going to improve the healthcare system as you volunteer or become part of an inspection system. So there's a lot of cross travel in this. Knowing what's required in a quality system is going to help with inspection success. We want our laboratories to be successful. We want them to be accurate. We want them to be safe for patients. And it's going to take the heart and soul of individuals like us working in the laboratory to make sure that we have inspection success and we're meeting the quality that we want, not only for our customers, but also for ourselves. So in learning about inspections and learning about quality improvement, you can also modify your career goals and other ideas. Again, going back to, is regulatory for you? Would you be interested in working for CAPRA Or perhaps are you interested in going for that technical supervisor position for high complexity? Knowing how to do all of this in, requires information and in knowing that information gives you the power to make steps towards the career goal that you are looking for. Next slide, please. Again, I would like to thank Mr. Branch and CDC Romland for having me today. I wish you all the best and I'm open to any questions that may be coming in. Thank you. Thank you so much. We'll take this time to answer a few questions. We'll try to answer as many as possible. If we do not answer your question today, we'll do our best to answer it via email. If you have any questions after today, please do not hesitate to email the CDC OneLab inbox at onelab at cdc.gov. Let's get started. Um, so this person wants to know, just to be clear, labs can get accreditation from CLEAR or or from CAP, how does the lab decide from one over the other? So for my experiences, labs will often start with CLIO just because that is the basic federal minimum standards that every lab has to meet. And as they get into more areas that they feel that they need more guidance into, especially in the molecular area, they may transition to CAP. However, no, there is a monetary component because there is a membership requirement for that. And you also have to meet more stringent standards than what CLIA offers. So it's really the laboratory's choice. But I would say, again, in my experience, many start with CLIA and then move on to CAP. Not saying that's the only way to do it. Um, well, this is a follow up. So, how often does CAP and CLIA inspections occur? That's a great question because. Since the pandemic has occurred, I am not in tune as to whether or not they are back to their routine schedule. Um, for us, my lab was every two years. I don't know if that has been different. I don't know if the virtual inspections have made things different. I don't know how back to quote unquote normal we are, but two years is a good note, uh, a good number to keep in mind. And it may be even more depending on the organization you're getting according to. Okay, um, let's see, I'll move to this one. This is a, a, a good one. We have a lot of international people on the, the call this week. So does CLIA and CAP provide accreditation to laboratories outside of the U.S. or only for the U.S.? That is another great question. I believe... CLIA is bound to the U.S. only. However, I know that uh, ASCP, American Society for Clinical Pathology, they do have an international certification. So I feel that there may be information out there as to CAPS uh, availability internationally. I'm not sure it would be a requirement as an international, but if a lab's interested in meeting those quality requirements, I would suggest reaching out to CAP to see if they could participate, even if it's only uh, for educational challenges, since they are not within the regulations of the U.S. Um, oh, this is a good one also. How will the FDA's proposed ruling on the regulation of LDTs impact CLIA or CAP regulations? Uh, 
this is this has got a lot of personal answers that I'm nervous about. If I, if not, we can we can we can send it to you by email and you can respond that way. If that's yeah, better. I think that would be a better one for email. Okay. There's definitely <laughs> okay. be no right or wrong answers here. All right. Thank you. Um We can provide that one for someone. Let's see. I'm trying to see. It's not the main difference between the two. Um, someone wanted to know if, if you don't have the answer, that's okay. If you knew the difference between the general um, technical supervisor and a general supervisor. Uh, I do not off the top of my head. They are spelled out in, in, the, in the right place. I don't know off the top of my head. And someone did confirm that CAP does does do credit accreditations internationally. Wonderful, that's great to know, thank you. And they can even send the PT samples. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is a good one since AI has now uh, become a big topic. Do you think CAP will release any regs on AI? My instinct says, if anything is available long enough, that regulation, regulations will come down regarding them. I know that there's already been times where uh, automation has been trying to replace laboratory professionals, and that can only get so far. Uh, I don't imagine that AI would be able to fully replace, but I imagine that there will be some components of it that get into the heart of the laboratory and will require regulation. Um, we'll take this one last one. Uh, is it an obligation to wait 35 to 52 weeks? What if the lab is not able to complete any, is able to complete all NCs and ready for accreditation? believe that that's just giving you a range of the amount of time. Uh, many of the labs that I work with, they get everything in line long before they actually put that application in so that they're on the plus of the shorter timeline. Uh, but if they are in a position where they're not able to meet that timeline, you would need to request an extension. Okay. It looks like that's all our questions for today. And I thank you again, Leah, for, for sharing your knowledge and expertise with us today. And I'm sure that this was helpful for laboratory professionals who have, you know, maybe considering an alternative uh, job career or how they can use what their, their current skills and develop additional skills to do something different. So I thank you for presenting this information. And we look forward to hearing from you again soon on the One Lab Network event. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks, Alicia and Leah.